Stay Curious, A Brief History of Stephen Hawking by Kathleen Krull and Paul Brewer, illustrated by Boris Kulikov. Stephen Hawking grew up in England asking questions among people who stretched their brains day and night. Sometimes his whole family ate dinner in silence, all of them reading their books. Other times, while tending to beehives in the basement or making fireworks in the greenhouse, they blasted opera music. On summer evenings, they sprawled out in the backyard to stare up at the stars. Stephen delighted in taking apart radios and clocks to see how things worked. Putting them back together, not as fun. His favorite toys were ones he could control, like model trains, airplanes, and boats. By age 12, he circled himself with good friends who liked to ask how and why the world worked. They had long discussions about how the universe began and other weighty matters. And they invented their own board games with large casts of characters and fiendishly hard rules to master. With the help of his math teacher, Dikran Taha, Stephen and his friends grew from creating board games into inventing a bare bones computer. Using insides from a clock, an old telephone switchboard, and other recycled parts, they came up with a machine that could solve basic math problems. It was 1958, way before most people knew what a computer was. Mr. Tata guided Stephen toward physics the science dealing with energy, motion, and time. Even though Stephen barely paid attention or studied, he still earned perfect scores on his college exams and won a scholarship. Stephen always credited Mr. Tata for his success. When each of us thinks about what we can do in life, chances are we can do it because of a teacher. At 17, he went to Oxford University where his dad, and unusually at the time, his mom had gone to college. Younger than most of his classmates, Stephen was lonely at first. He spent his time devouring science fiction novels instead of studying. He never took notes in class and only bought textbooks to check them for mistakes. Good grades came easily to Stephen, but making new friends was hard. He decided to join the rowing club because rowers were popular and he blossomed. Never an athlete, he became the one who steers the boat. Stephen loved to be in charge of the eight burly rowers, but sometimes he couldn't resist daredevil moves like deliberately steering his crew into rival boats. Then for some unknown reason, steering the boat became harder. Stephen, who always wanted to control things, started losing control of his body. Tying his shoelaces was frustrating and his words sometimes slurred. He even stumbled down a flight of stairs. Keeping his problems secret, he graduated, moving on to the University of Cambridge for an advanced degree in the science of the universe. On a visit home one day, he fell while ice skating with his mother and couldn't get up. His worried parents took him for medical help. For weeks, he underwent a series of painful tests. The news was not good. He had amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. The nerves that controlled his voluntary muscles, the ones that allow us to move, speak, and even breathe, were shutting down. At age 21, Stephen was given just two years to live. Devastated, Stephen spent hours alone, listening to operas and closing himself away from everyone, even his new girlfriend, Jane Wilde. But he remembered his roommate in the hospital, a young boy painfully dying from cancer. There were, pe were people in much worse situations than his. What brought him joy was creating and exploring worlds in his mind, something he could continue to do since the disease did not affect his brain. Work to him 
was like playing a game, the game of universe. And thankfully, Stephen Hawking was still able to play. He found a focus he'd lacked. Before my condition was diagnosed, I had been very bored with life, he said later. ALS made him more inventive. I was forced to travel through the universe in my mind and try to visualize the ways in which it worked. He had another motive for going on. He had fallen deeply in love with Jane and to marry her, he had to complete his degree and get a job in his field. Their engagement changed my life and gave me something to live for, he said. Jane was more than inspiration. Stubborn about getting outside help, Stephen relied on her for everything, from seeing to his medical needs to typing his work. By now he had difficulty walking without crutches and his speech was getting harder to understand. Eating and bathing became difficult and terrible choking fits afflicted him. His fingers began to curl. He was losing control over them. But four years after doctor had, doctors had given him two years to live, he and Jane had their first child. He called Robert's birth the best moment of his life. Two more children, Lucy and Timothy, followed. Stephen loved playing with them as much as he could, especially board games like chess and Monopoly. He once said, it would not be much of a universe if it wasn't home to the people you love. Stephen lost the ability to write by hand, but his memory became a kind of superpower. Once he taught his students a 40 step equation all from memory, as his speech became more garbled, people who knew him well would interpret his words for others. For as long as he could, he pulled himself up the stairs each night and got ready for bed on his own. Inching his way upward took so long that he passed the time doing calculations in his head. Stephen put off using a wheelchair, but once he gave in at the end of the 1960s, he became notorious for daredevil driving. Maintaining his impish sense of humor, he was rumored to accidentally run over the toes of people he didn't like. He swore that the rumor was false, and I'll run over anyone who repeats it. His questions never ceased, and he finally started finding answers. In 1973, at age 31, he published his first book, which tried to show that the universe started at a single point and expanded rapidly, shooting the building blocks of everything out into the darkness. We call this the Big Bang, the beginning of all space and time. But even he described it in his book as unreadable and it wasn't successful. The following year, Stephen discovered something new about black holes those mysterious places created when stars die. Scientists believe that black holes swallowed anything that fell into them, allowing nothing to escape. Stephen found that black holes aren't entirely black and can in fact leak light in the form of radiation. Word of his dizzying discovery, which became known as Hawking radiation, spread and sparked his international reputation. Five years later, he was appointed to an important university job held by genius scientist Isaac Newton. As part of the ceremony, Stephen was required to sign the official book. He did with great difficulty, and that was the last time he ever signed his name. Friends and students created gadgets to work around his disabilities, but he needed more help. In 1980, he finally accepted some trained nursing services. Nurses, after all, could free him to ask more questions. As Stephen's care got more ex expensive, he set out to write a book about his research to earn money for the family. My goal is simple, he said. It is a complete understanding of the universe why it is 
as it is and why it exists at all. This time, Stephen was determined to create a book that would make sense to everyone, not just scientists. Writing it was agony. Revisions, also not very fun. At last, a brief history of time from the Big Bang to black holes was ready. Much to everyone's astonishment, it raced to the top of the bestseller lists. People hungered to know the mystery of life all explained in one book. It still wasn't as easy to understand as he'd hoped, but just owning the book made people feel smarter, even if it sat unread on their coffee tables. Stephen's genius mind was awe-inspiring, even trapped within his powerless body. He was a triumphant life force, almost otherworldly. He won awards from around the world and traveled to accept them whenever he could. He was recognized everywhere. The wheelchair gives me away. So Stephen embraced fame, holding court at parties in his hotel room, wheelchair dancing into the wee hours while disco lights twinkled. Just because I do a lot of thinking doesn't mean I don't like parties and getting into trouble, he said. Then, in 1985, while he fought off pneumonia, surgeons had to insert a tube into his neck to allow him to breathe. He lost the use of his voice forever. Friends fitted a small computer and a speech synthesizer into his wheelchair. Stephen now spoke in a robot-like voice with an American accent. His health declined so much that he finally had to have around-the-clock nursing care. But when he was well enough, he would roll into a room like he was riding a chariot, surrounded by students and fans. He crossed into pop culture, showing off his wit with appearances on Star Trek The Next Generation, The Simpsons, and The Big Bang Theory. He joked around on talk shows, and unusually for most scholars, never hesitated to poke fun at himself. Life would be tragic if it weren't funny, he insisted. Stephen always threw a romp of a party for his birthdays, setting off fireworks to celebrate how many years he had survived. On his 60th birthday, having lived almost 40 years longer than doctors predicted, he took a ride in a hot air balloon designed to fit his wheelchair. By age 65, he was passionate about becoming one of the first space tourists. On a visit to the Space Center in Florida, he took a special jet and was able to freely float out of his wheelchair to achieve the delights of weightlessness. Space, here I come, he said. Within the next two years, Stephen became almost completely paralyzed. He still looked ahead, searching for life on other planets, working on apps and joining Facebook to communicate the joy of his journey. I'm in no hurry to die, he said in 2011. I have so much I want to do first. He had to miss his 70th birthday party in 2012 because he was in the hospital. But later that year, he opened the Summer Paralympics for athletes with disabilities. We are all different, but we share the same human spirit. When he turned 73, he threw a Pluto party. Everyone had to dress as an object in the sky. Stephen came as Pluto himself, the Roman god of the underworld. Before the fireworks, always fireworks, he urged partiers to support space exploration. He kept on asking questions, making discoveries, and taking stands on social justice, world events, and rights for people with disabilities. Just 10 days after writing a scientific article, Stephen died peacefully at home at age 76. He was one of the world's longest survivors of ALS. The questions he asked coaxed open new galaxies of scientific thought. 
At the same time, he inspired everyone with his sense of playfulness in the search. No one undertakes research in physics with the intention of winning a prize. It is the joy of discovering something no one knew before. Always with a cosmic sense of humor, Stephen Hawking pushed science ahead.